We are on the northeastern section of the island, approaching the Concord Valley to view the farm of an award-winning cocoa farmer, Mr. Stewart Paris. There we will take a view of the integrated farming system that is incorporated in terms of an agroforestry system and the management system that is in place on that cocoa farm. In 2010, someone told me that by 2016, cocoa was going to be one of the highest demand agricultural product in the world. And they said to me, try to flood the market. This is going to be impossible. You will never be able to flood the market. The chocolate industry is valued at $130 billion a year. So I moved, um, I took the information and started right away to propagate my own okay. plants. I'm the farm owner, I'm not here every day. Okay. My daughter, and she handles the post harvest mm. and the marketing and everything like mm. that. Our crop of choice for intercropping on this farm is dasheen. Okay. And we choose dasheen because of the way the environment here is. Okay, yeah. There's a high level of moisture here yeah, that is, is conducive for dashing growth okay. and production. Yeah. In December of last year, I told the farm manager that we would try to plant 100,000 dashin for 2020. Okay, that's a good So I, I said to him, I gave him a joke, I said to him, if you plant 100,000 dashins and we lose 50,000, but we can sell 50,000 and each one weigh one pound, oh, it's 50,000 yeah. $50, dollars. I say if you count it forward and you count it reverse, it's still the same money. Fortunately, on this farm, we have a lot of snakes. This farm that you're standing on is infested with snakes. snakes. We don't kill them. Um, my workers have special instructions not to harm the snake because the rat want to eat our cocoa and the snake want to eat the rat. It costs us nothing. Okay. The snake lives on the farm, it kills the rats for us. We save our cocoa, we sell our cocoa, we get our money and the snake is there. Yeah, yeah. We pay nothing for it. So we're very fortunate on this farm to have the place infested with snakes. Pests and diseases may pose a serious threat to cocoa production. Though over 1,500 different pests feed on cocoa, only 2% are of economic importance. Some pests to look out for on the field are capsids, stem borers, mealybugs, stink bugs, pod borers, aphids, caterpillars, black pod, frosty pod, and witch's broom. Best practice is to adopt an integrated pest management system to include the application of pesticides and fungicides preventatively at key times of the year as some pests only occur periodically. On Paris's second farm, his pests are under control, but he has to use rodenticide to control his rodent population. His choice of crop to intercrop here is also different. Welcome to our smaller farm. Okay. This is in the, um, in the Vauxhall area where they call Sandley. Okay. So we have 3.2 acres here and it's fully cultivated but we have interplanted um, other crops. The main interplanting crop that we use is plantains. And the reason why we did it is because this area, unlike our bigger farm here is very, is a lot hotter than the bigger farm. So we know cocoa for them to thrive well, particularly when they're young and in the shade. So we figured that by planting plantains through the cocoa, when the plantain grew up, it could give the cocoa some shade and then when the plant and produce, we could cut the bunch and sell it and make some money. If Paris ideally manages his three acre farm, he should expect a yield in excess of 600 kilograms of cocoa, as the optimum yield per acre is approximately 200 kilograms per year. The cocoa we have in Dominica and the cocoa I have on my farm is premium cocoa. It's 100% fine flavor cocoa. It's not the bulk that they're getting from Ivory Coast. We have an advantage that we can seize and make a future out of it. We have a top quality product, a, a premium product, that we are not about to give away. We want to get paid for it. Out of the 130 billion, we only aim in to get one billion. And we want to work hard for it. We don't want any favors. Dominica is an award-winning destination for cocoa. The buyer must not be telling us what he's going to pay us for cocoa. We want to tell him what we're selling it for. Intercropping in cocoa serves two purposes, shade regulation and in the short term as an income earner. 
Next, we visit a farmer whose shade and windbreak saved his farm from the ravages of Hurricane Maria. We are actually in Milton Syndicate. Milton Syndicate is on the northwestern part of the island. We are visiting to the, the holding of Mr. Whitney Louis. Mr. Whitney Louis is one of the leading cocoa farmers in Dominica. His farm is one of the farms actually that survived the ravages of Hurricane Maria. Along with me is Mr. Franklin Joseph, he's the cocoa coordinator, and he'll be responsible for most of the rehabilitation aspect of the program. The reason why we in this area, it's an area where you look out of after Maria, you see most of the trees have survived the storm much better and that's the main reason of, of that it, for that is because of the windbreak. If you look at the borders, all of the farm is enclosed all along the perimeter with good nice windbreaks, you know, and in this case the windbreak is mainly mango trees. It's an excellent windbreak, resilient, it can handle the force of the wind, you know, so the whole field is pretty much enclosed. Okay, that's a very nice tree, um, but one of the things that we are trying to do is to keep the trees at a certain, a certain height so that the farmers can actually harvest their, their fruits without having to climb the tree or use a, a pole. If you look carefully, you can see a hocket, which is a, a, a branch that is growing and it grows straight, it's very aggressive and it, it, it passes the canopy and it goes up by itself. Right, so what we're going to do is to remove that branch. In cutting out the branch, we, we don't cut out here. At the beginning, we try to, to remove the weight at the top of the branch to avoid the branch from um, splitting. All right, so. Okay. And we, we want to cut off um, the, the jacket as close as possible to the main branch because termites actually love cocoa. And if you leave that piece of branch, eventually it will dry up and the termites will in, infest it and go down to the, to the main branch. As you can see, we gave it a nice clean cut as close as possible to the stem as possible. One of the next things we have to do right now is to cover the cut with um, some, some paint, right? To avoid water settling there or different things like that, you know? Another important step is the spacing of cocoa trees. In dry microclimates, trees can be spaced as close as 10 to 12 feet apart. But in more damp regions, cocoa trees should be 13 to 15 feet apart from each other to allow for proper airflow that minimizes moisture and disease. Cocoa is a manageable crop. No, you can keep it as short as you want. So you can certainly grow and harvest all your cocoa. It is a productive crop. It is a payable crop. It's a steady income. I get in a steady income from my cocoa. I'm 88 years now. I'm willing to support any young person. Because as far as I'm hearing, there is market for our cocoa worldwide. If one has followed all these steps, you should expect a bountiful harvest. But after harvest, there's still more that can be done to unlock the full potential of the bean. <laughs>